but it's good to see many familiar faces. I'm glad you could all come this morning. My name is Ramananda. I know some of you, maybe not all. I'm the director of the Integral Yoga Institute here in San Francisco. And it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce Michael Lerner. I consider a, a, a teacher and a friend. Uh, let me say a few words of introduction, though some of you also are probably very familiar with Michael. He's the president and co-founder of Commonweal in Bolinas, California, uh, an organization that he helped to found back in the mid 1970s. After having uh, received a PhD and teaching at Yale in an earlier part of his life, he moved to California in the mid 70s and, and uh, from my perspective um, began a life focused on bringing healing both to individuals uh, and to the earth. At any given time, the Commonweal program has at least six, seven, if not 10 initiatives going on. Things like the Commonweal Cancer Help Program, Healing Circles, Beyond Conventional Cancer Therapies, uh, and the new school at Commonweal. Uh, I believe uh, Michael recently started an initiative looking at alternative therapies, uh, complementary therapies for, uh, for the COVID virus. Um, so I, I've been fortunate to uh, have an opportunity to learn from you over the years, Michael, and to spend a little time with you, which I hope we have more, more of in the future. But uh, thanks so much for agreeing to spend some time with us and, and share from your, uh, that's the last thing I'll share maybe is you're the most widely read person I know. So I appreciate your sharing from that kind of vast perspective that you've developed. Thank you, Swamiji. Um, good morning, all. Greetings, all. Um, I know many of you, and I'm so glad to be here with you. Um, it's a joy to be back at the San Francisco Integral Yoga Institute. I can't remember how many times I've spoken for the San Francisco IYI. I know I began to teach yoga at the IYI in 1983. I know that my wife, Charlotte, and I were married at the San Francisco Integral Yoga Institute late that year. 1982-83 was a hard year. My dog died. My father developed a serious cancer. My first marriage had ended, and Commonweal, which I had founded uh, seven years earlier, went into a deep financial crisis. I off 40 people, including myself, only the business manager and the front desk person were left, and my board of directors lost faith in me. But good things also happened in that two-year period. I met a beautiful young physician named Sandra Amrita McClanahan. She lived at Yogaville at Satchitananda Ashram in rural Virginia, south of Charlottesville. She invited me down to meet Swami Satchitananda, and we met with him in an air-conditioned trailer on a sweltering summer day near the extraordinary overlook that looks down on the James River and the whole valley below. Meeting Swamiji was unforgettable. He was such a tall, handsome, beautiful, radiant human being. He moved and spoke with such infinite grace. We told him that we were in love. He looked at us and gestured with the index finger of his right hand. I want you both to write down everything you love about the other person, he said. That was wise advice. It turned out that Sandra would not leave the ashram and I would not leave Commonweal. We ended up lifelong friends. Later that year, I married the woman who had become my second wife, Cheryl Patton. We've now been married for 37 years. We still love each other, and more important than that, we're still friends. This is in many ways a talk about the power of friendship, especially soul friendships, in times of crisis in our lives and in times of a global crisis, such as the global poly crisis. It is a talk not only about friendships, but about the power of community in times of personal or uh, environmental or planetary crisis. 
the power and resilience of community and the power of spiritual life and community. In many of the ancient traditions, friendship was prized actually above all other relationships. It was certainly prized above marriage, above kinship, perhaps even above the relationship of the spiritual teacher to the student. I'm not certain about the latter, but I could make a case that friendship ranks higher among human relationships than any of the rest. The reason why is simply this. It's very easy to get disappointed by marriage. We know today that half of all marriages end in divorce and far more are deeply ambivalent relationships at best. We might imagine that kinship, kinship ranks above friendship, but we all know the tensions in any family, no matter how much the people love each other. All these relationships involve what the great Quaker teacher Parker Palmer calls entanglements. We love each other, and yet the entanglements make the relationships deeply complex. You might think that a spiritual teacher-student relationship is higher than friendship, but the truth is, People get disappointed by spiritual teachers all the time. It's a lot like falling in love. You meet a spiritual teacher, you fall in love with him or her and their teachings, and then at some point you discover to your deep dismay that, guess what? The spiritual teacher is actually a human being. You may have wanted the spiritual teacher to be a pure manifestation of the divine. It is rarely, if ever so. I have met perhaps a half dozen truly great spiritual teachers in my lifetime. Every one of them turned out to be human. Being a spiritual teacher is a hard gig. My friend and colleague, Rachel Naomi Remen, once said to me that the lesson of a lifetime incarnated as a spiritual teacher is a lesson in the exercise of power. Authentic spiritual teachers, and for that matter, inauthentic ones, have immense psychic power. It's very difficult for them to avoid ever using those psychic powers for anything in their personal human interests. That is why so many spiritual teachers end up disappointing their students. It takes a mature student to recognize that the greatness of the spiritual teacher does not exclude their deeply human aspect. In fact, the mature student is actually set free by the humanity of the spiritual teacher it is not dissimilar to the point in a love relationship where the incandescent in-love experience begins to fade. You find yourself discovering the actual human being that you fell in love with. That is the point at which marriages either deepen or fail. And it's also the point at which a mature student discovers what it means to deeply appreciate and yet to declare independence from a great spiritual teacher who is also a human being. Swami Satchidananda was a great spiritual teacher. He was also a human being. As I came to realize that Swamiji was human, I quite quickly experienced a deep sense of relief. If even a great spiritual teacher was human, then surely I was allowed to be human. In some ways, Swamiji's humanity was one of the deepest lessons he taught me. Because when you realize that your teacher is human, you have only three real choices. The first is to be disillusioned. The second, which is closely related, is to go looking for a teacher who will be perfect and have no trace of human fallibility. Neither of those choices usually ends up well. So the third choice, the only enlightened choice in my judgment, is to start looking for the guru in you. He actually taught that he was a signpost, that he was pointing you toward the discovery of the guru in you. He said the ashram was like a nursery. It was a place for young, tender plants to be sheltered and grow up out of their seed beds. Of course, there were swamis who would stay to attend the seed beds, and there were others who simply loved being near the teacher and loved ashram life. But for the rest of us, the time would come sooner or later when it was time to leave the ashram. I never actually lived at the ashram. I have never been a joiner of any community in that sense. No matter how profoundly I was influenced by Swamiji and the teachings of integral yoga, I always kept a certain inner distance. It's part of my temperament. Oh, the psycho-spiritual system called Enneagram, the nine-pointed circle with nine different fundamental character types. 
I am the Enneagram Five, known as the Buddha point. The Five specializes in detachment. So by my nature, I've always kept a certain distance. But the teachings of integral yoga had a profound effect on me that I still feel 37 years later. I find integral yoga to be one of the purest teachings of the great and ancient yoga tradition. Swamiji designed it to be easy to learn in bite-sized pieces. He described the integral yoga hatha classes as the, quote, calling card of integral yoga, a place where people could come and within a few months begin to experience the deep power of a regular asana practice. Integral yoga was gentle, simple, and straightforward. But if the classes were the calling card, the gates of the mansion of integral yoga opened into a cosmology as profound as any in the spiritual world. You could start with the hatha yoga asanas. You could begin to learn the immense power of breathing practices. You could discover the extraordinary power of chanting. You could go deep into meditation. But some of the deepest lessons of all were of yoga as a way of life, which Swamiji encapsulated in simple phrases like, a life of dedication is the path to inner peace. To me, that's been one of the most profound of all the teaching. Or take it easy, but not lazy. Or truth should be, truth, speech should be truthful, useful, and peaceful. Or adopt, adjust, accommodate. Perhaps there is no single phrase in integral yoga with more power than, quote, truth is one, paths are many. The Light of Truth Universal Shrine or Lotus Shrine at Yogaville is a living manifestation of that teaching. The meditation room has a neon shaft of life that rises from the center of the circular floor in the, med in the meditation room, reaches the ceiling and arcs down into a dozen different shrines distributed around the edge of the room, representing the major religions of the world as well as shrines for the secular and for all other religions known and unknown. Now I have to confess that while truth is one, paths are many, may seem obvious to many of us, it is in fact a deeply contested view in theology and religious studies. Another view, I think it comes from a, um, uh, a meditation uh, teacher, someone like Jack Kornfield uh, in Insight Meditation, may not be Jack, uh, but he characterized it, someone did, as, quote, all paths lead us to get lost in the same woods. Religious scholars like my friend Mary Evelyn Tucker at Yale deeply dispute the view that truth is one and paths are many, and I think most religious scholars would dispute it. This view that truth is one, paths are many, is sometimes called the perennial philosophy. The great philosopher Leibniz coined the phrase. Aldous Huxley made it famous in a book called The Perennial Philosophy that he wrote in World War II, which is well worth looking at. It has a deeply distinguished history, but it is important to realize that truth is one, paths are many, is a construct like other constructs. It can be debated. I choose to believe it because I choose a non-dual understanding of the spiritual world, but I do not judge others who make another choice. Eight years ago, I gave a talk at the Integral Yoga Institute in San Francisco, and a friend who I did not know well yet came. She was powerfully affected by my talk. We began to meet to share our experiences of life in general and of the spiritual world. Our friendship grew. She became a soul friend. We have been through many changes in our lives in the past eight years, sickness and health, joys and sorrows, but it is in the nature of a true soul friendship that the soul friend cannot disappoint you, not if you understand soul friendship in the full sense of the word. It is true that friends, friendships can lead people in different directions over time. People grow in different ways. The test of a true soul friendship, I believe, is that growth in different directions does not threaten it. Indeed, growth in different directions deepens our understanding of what soul friendship truly means. To put it in different words, we all have personalities, and we all have something that we can call soul or essence. Friendships tend to begin at the personality level. But the agenda of the personality is by its nature very different from the agenda of the soul. They say that when the personality laughs, the soul cries. 
They say that when the personality cries, the soul laughs. The soul is that part that lies below the personality. And on this point, the, the personality tends to have an egoic, expansive, dominating uh, energy that tries to uh, encompass more and more. And the soul, by contrast, has given up that kind of energy, really never had it in the first place. It is the true self that was not recognized or welcomed into the world. And we created the personality in order to defend ourselves. And really, in many teachings, the second half of life is about dismantling or going beyond the personality and getting back to the soul. So there are many ways of speaking of soul. Many different words are attached to it. But a soul friendship ultimately reaches the place where the essence of both people are in some mysterious and fundamental way connected. In my judgment, soul friendships are where the mature person goes after they have discovered that a great teacher is actually human. They can remain deeply grateful for the teaching they receive. They can be grateful for the freedom they were given by the humanity of the teacher. But instead of denying the validity of the spiritual teaching or chasing after a perfect teacher, they go within to discover their inner teacher. That is where the real work, the great work, as they call it in the spiritual traditions, begins. The mature student, let us call them now the mature seeker, goes within, and they discover a great paradox. They discover that they cannot do this inner work by themselves. So they need to find what Parker Palmer calls circles of trust and what we at Commonweal call healing circles. They need to find friends with whom they can explore their deepest experience of spiritual truth. If they are fortunate, they may find soul friendships in these circles. Now, these circles of trust may, in fact, often be found in the spiritual communities created by their teachers that have nourished them. But the mature seeker may also discover new circles that nourish them, new expressions of the great work offered by other traditions, and in fields such as literature, music, the arts, and communities of service. Now, I promised this talk with you would be about struggle and peace in the global poly crisis. And while the first segment of my talk may seem like a diversion, actually it's critical to what I have to say. For the bottom line for me is that in the global poly crisis, the only thing that can give us the courage and strength to respond with compassion and wisdom is to live lives rich in circles of trust, in connection with family and friends, in connection with our communities, and guided above all by what we can learn of our own souls through soul friendship. 44 years ago, I was walking at the edge of a small town on the Pacific coast just north of San Francisco called Bolinas. I looked out across a landscape of high grass and clusters of trees extending several miles to the north. My eyes fell on something I had often seen before, an old white building nestled amid some trees. I knew it to be the old Marconi, Marconi RCA headquarters where radio transmissions from North America to Asia began. As I looked at the building, something extraordinary happened. It was a cloudy day with strands of mist blown gently off the Pacific. Sunlight was playing through the clouds and the mist, creating dappled patterns in the high yellow grass. As I watched this beautiful play of sunlight, clouds, and mist, quite suddenly, a seemingly intense shaft of sunlight fell directly onto the old white building, illuminating it with a steady golden glow. I looked at this sight with an inner sense of awe a sense formed in my mind that this was to be the site of a new center dedicating to healing ourselves and healing the earth. It was an astonishing thought. Here I was, 40 years old, having, actually, that's not right. I was less than that. Um, here I was, uh, let's see, 37, I guess, uh, having just left a tenure track teaching position at Yale, to start a residential center for delinquent kids in Bolinas uh, about three years earlier, uh, four years earlier. It was going well, and yet I had come to know that this was not my life work. Now, 
the shaft of sunlight falling on this old white building opened up for me a life work that seemed laid out before me. The idea that it could be accomplished was beyond audacious, and yet there it was. 44 years, Commonweal is just that, a center for healing ourselves and healing the earth, a center with over 30 programs in health and healing, education and the arts, and environment and justice. I will name just a few, our week-long cancer help programs, 220 over uh, 34 years, Healing Circles Global, which is taking the core work of the cancer help program around the world uh, for people with many different concerns and conditions. Beyond Conventional Cancer Therapies, the best website on the web for integral cancer therapies. The new school at Commonweal with three, over 300 podcasts and videos. But it was never about one person. Burr Hanneman, who co-founded Commonweal with me, rewrote the laws governing California fisheries and saw them into implementation. David Steinhardt has led our work in juvenile justice and closed the immense California youth prison system, finding better community facilities for thousands of young people of color who were once incarcerated there. My wife, Shaw Patton, was co-chair of the great global effort that won the first global treaty, banning the most toxic chemicals in the world. My colleague, Rachel Naomi Remen, is medical director of the Cancer Health Program and started the Institute for the Study of Health and Illness, that brought a program called the Healer's Art to medical students across the country and around the world. That's a very partial list. Many staff have stayed at Commonweal for decades. It's not a place that most people want to leave once they've found it. Our programs touch people locally, regionally, nationally, and globally, yet we work quietly. Sachi Dananda used to say that it was okay to be, quote, usefully visible, unquote, so that people could find you. I think that describes Commonweal. We don't blow our own horn. We don't outrun our headlights. We let our work speak for us. A very core dimension of our work over the past five years, but actually reaching back all the way to the beginning, is the exploration of what resilience means in the poly crisis. So what is the global poly crisis? A few years ago, no one understood the term at all. But now with COVID-19, climate change, growing disparities between rich and poor, out of control technologies with unprecedented numbers of refugees on the move around the world. Many people have begun to have a sense of what the poly crisis might mean. My elevator speech about the poly crisis goes as follows. There are tens of thousands of foundations and hundreds of thousands of NGOs focused on every silo issue under the sun, climate change, poverty, women's rights, racial justice, all the rest. But there are almost no foundations and very few NGOs focused on the mother of all these silo issues, the poly crisis itself. We set out to strengthen the global network of those with the courage to look directly into the poly crisis. And let me say this task is not unlike looking directly at death itself. There is a community of scholars and activists, of thinkers and doers around the world who are focused on understanding the global poly crisis. It has many different names. Some call it the human dilemma. Some call it the global problematique. On the internet, it's sometimes called Teotwaki for short, which stands for the end of the world as we know it. The way I have come to describe it, drawing on much of the work that went before my own, is as a set of several dozen global stressors. These include social, environmental, technological, and financial economic stressors. These global stressors are interacting with increasing force and increasing unpredictability. They are creating ever more frequent future shocks. COVID-19 is a poster child for these future shocks. Pandemics have always in human history been global stressors. Climate change is a relatively new global stressor. The toxification of the entire biosphere with toxic chemicals only began largely after World War II. High levels of human population is another global stressor, especially confined, combined with ever higher levels of human consumption. 
Topsoil from fertile land is disappearing. Fresh drinking water is ever harder to find. Nuclear weapons and nuclear power remain a source of great peril. Artificial intelligence, facial recognition technologies, and human tracking devices involve a technology that can be interchangeably used to track COVID-19 or terrorists or criminals or ordinary citizens in authoritarian regime. Daniel Ellsberg of Pentagon Papers fame said not long ago that if we do not yet live in a totalitarian state, all the levers of totalitarianism are now in place. For many years, those studying and thinking about the global poly crisis felt a little like Hebrew prophets in the desert, warning of disaster if the Jews did not come to their senses and return to God. But the poly crisis, as I said, made a lot of people who earlier had said, I don't see how it moves the needle to talk about the poly crisis, or I don't, I don't really see where that's going to go for you. And these are very smart, sophisticated people, some of whom are on this call, for which I give great thanks. Uh, but when the poly crisis came, and the incredible interactivity of the poly crisis uh, with the economic system, with the political systems, with climate change and all the rest, with migration, all of these things began to come together. Then people moved from saying, I don't see how this moves the needle, to saying, oh yeah, of course, the poly crisis is real, but what are we going to do about it? So that's beginning to happen with thoughtful people who think about these things. But this week, a particularly striking report was issued that confirms almost precisely our own analysis at the highest levels of the US government. The Washington Post reported uh, on Thursday uh, that um, uh, the headline was, um, uh, US intelligence officials have little comfort to offer a pandemic weary planet about where the world is headed in the next 20 years. Short answer, it looks pretty big, so uh, pretty bleak. So the National Intelligence Council, which is a really big deal, released its quadrennial global trends report. The report foresaw a world unsettled by the coronavirus pandemic, the ravages of climate change, which will propel mass migration, and the widening gap between what people demand from their leaders and what they can actually deliver. They described the pandemic as a... Uh, with my thing here. There we go. They described the pandemic as a preview of crises to come. The, they described the pandemic as, quote, the most significant singular global disruption since World War II that reminds the world of its fragility and has shaken long-held assumptions about how well governments and institutions could respond to catastrophe. The pandemic exacerbated social and economic fissures that had already emerged, and it understand the risk of more and cascading global challenges, ranging from disease to climate change to disruptions from new technologies and financial crises. So you have exactly the same list that I gave you. And I would particularly note the use of the phrase cascading challenges, because that is the word and the phrase that President Biden used in his inaugural talk to talk about what we were facing. He talked about COVID and climate change and the financial crisis, but cascading crises is the language that the power elite in the United States has selected for the global poly crisis. And so keep your eye out uh, for that phrase. So the report talked about the looming disequilibrium between existing and future challenges and the ability of institutions to respond. They talked about fragmentations in societies and large segments of the world population wary of institutions they, they see as unable to address their needs. Um, and they talked about how the effects of the pandemic will lim linger as a warming world leads to new human conflicts, including in the most dire scenario, global food shortages that spawn mass violence. Now they talked about five different scenarios from a rosy scenario to a bleak one. 
that we don't need to go into. But the point of this excursion into this uh, is that um, uh, what we started talking about three years ago is now in the quadrennial report of the national intelligence community. And the reality of the poly crisis is truly there for all to see. So that concludes my written notes. And from here on, I'm just flying uh, open and blind with uh, the reflections I want to share with you. So here's the basic question for you. We're all living in the poly crisis. There's just no question about it. The question is, how do we live in the poly crisis? And I'll give you a specific example. What do you tell your children about the poly crisis? Or what do you tell children? What do you tell them? Particularly when they're playing video games where dystopian futures are all over. And in fact, many children and young people totally believe we're living in the poly crisis. So what are you to say? Here's another example. Some of you know the psycho-spiritual uh, uh, archetypal psychology called Enneagram, which posits something I'm fascinated by, which some of you know, which posits nine personality types. Uh, the perfectionist, uh, the helper, the achiever, the individualist, uh, uh, the observer, the loyalist, the enthusiast, the iconoclast, and the peacemaker. And each of these nine types is subdivided into three subtypes. Uh, some are self-preservation, some are socially oriented, some are one-to-one -one oriented. So there's actually a, a series of 27 different subtypes. And it goes on beyond that, but I'll leave it at 27. So from the point of view of understanding how we respond to the poly crisis in this and in many other systems of personality, you don't have to use that one. But, you know, the, the, the uh, psychiatric manual lists about seven or 10 as well. But the point is that each personality will respond differently to the poly crisis as they respond differently to everything else in life. So here's the point. There are some personality types that happen to be reasonably well designed to look at and live with the poly crisis. There are others that find it incredibly difficult. Uh, if you are a type seven, which is um, uh, the enthusiast, um, and probably if you're this type, you really love sunny days, sunlight just fills you with light, and you don't like to think about dark things. They, they really bring you down. And you are often filled with different plans. If this doesn't work out, I've got plan B and plan C. But you're always looking for the light. So when somebody tells you about the poly crisis, what are you supposed to do? Where do you put that in your particular personality construct? So that's a simple example. My personality construct, the observer, is pretty much ideally suited to look at the poly crisis because the observer separates feelings from thought. And so we're able to look at crises in general and the poly crisis in particular without being overwhelmed by our emotions. But on the other hand, there are a lot of drawbacks to that. Um, so uh, the point is there won't be one answer to how we live with the poly crisis. That's the key point. So then the question becomes, what, what can we do that might be general, that might be generally applicable to live in the poly crisis. And the first thing I would say is to remember that large parts of the world have lived in the poly crisis since the beginning of time. That uh, all over the world, low-income communities, particularly low-income communities of color, but uh, white communities as well, um, live in 
ongoing disaster areas that are exacerbated by the poly crisis, but they've been living in disaster forever. And one of the things we can learn from looking at these communities is that some of them, perhaps even many of them, have found forms of resilience that work under extraordinarily difficult conditions. They have found ways of living with immense difficulty and yet leading lives, beautiful, often beautiful lives of meaning in the midst of it all. Now, what enables them to do that? It is as though in deep crisis, the only way to authentically survive is to find whatever our deepest faith is, whether it's a religious faith, a spiritual faith, a faith about family, a faith in the natural world, some core of meaning that really speaks most deeply to us. So the question becomes not what is a global solution to living in the poly crisis, but how do you personally live in the poly crisis? How do you choose to live in it? And remember that the idea that the world as we know it is coming to an end is not a new idea in human history. The ancient Hebrews absolutely believed that. Uh, Maimonides said it was not permitted to count the number of days until the Messiah would return. So there was a sense of acute expectation that in the midst of the poly crisis that they were living in, which was horrifically hard, that the Messiah was coming soon. The followers of Jesus likewise believed that he was returning soon. I mean, not later, but soon. And they believed, actually, that they would be physically uh, uh, returned to life, that the dead would physically be returned to life. So my point is that not only low-income communities uh, forever, but also a number of the religious and spiritual communities have lived with that belief structure that the end of the world was coming soon, and yet they managed to live beautiful, deep lives. From over 34 years of working with people with life-threatening cancers, and having gone through some fairly life-threatening experiences myself, I know, I know for certain that perhaps the best response to just deep crisis in our personal life is to turn inward and find that source of faith in something greater than we are, however we understand that. And at the heart of that faith is kindness of heart, consciousness of mind and dedication to service of the hands. We all have heart, heads, and hands. And in almost all the great traditions, love, wisdom, and will are the three core ways that we can respond. So I don't pretend to have the answer to this. I struggle with it all the time. But I will tell you this. I will tell you that in the beginning, I thought the work was to make everyone aware of the poly crisis. And a great turning in my own life has been to ask myself how to answer this question. The poly crisis is what in... Um, in some uh, high-level uh, areas of, of thought about the world uh, is called a wicked problem. 
And a wicked problem, if you look up a wicked problem, is a problem that you don't know how to fix it because anything you might try might actually make it worse rather than better. So we don't know what interventions will turn out to be good and what interventions will turn out to be bad. But we do know that humanity is in this bottleneck of human and biological evolution. We know without any question that the extant biodiversity is disappearing at the fastest rate since the end of the age of dinosaurs, and that only a fraction of that biodiversity will make it through this bottleneck, which is caused by all these global stressors. And we know for a fact that the question of whether humanity will make it through the bottleneck is very much up for grabs. And we especially know that if human humanity makes it through the bottleneck, what kind of humanity is going to make it through the bottleneck? Who will we be? Or who will the post-human species be? And what will their relationship be to the things that we hold dear? like love and compassion and justice, like love of the natural world. So in a very deep way, we have a task before us. Even though we don't know how to solve the polycrisis, our task is to learn to live in the polycrisis. And our task is to live in the polycrisis in ways that strengthen the values and the sanctity of the human spirit that we hold so dear. And that is a very great task. And our task, in as much as we can work on the polycrisis itself, is to move it toward better outcomes. So we don't know what the outcome is going to be. As the National Intelligence Council put it, they gave you five, seven different scenarios. But one thing for sure, the outcome is not written in stone. If we do better with climate change, there will be less climate change. If we end toxic chemicals, there will be less toxic chemicals. If we create equal distribution or more equal distribution of wealth in the world, uh, there will be less suffering and more movement towards sustainability. Uh, if we give up war, as a way of resolving disputes, then an immense portion of all that is spent uh, outside of you know, individual expenditures and, and, and business could be redirected toward creating a better world. Now, we don't know if any of this is possible, but we know that this is our task. And when we have a task like that, when we have, you know, Nietzsche uh, said, those that have a why to live can bear most any how. Those who have a why to live can bear most any how. I can tell you in the Cancer Help Program, I remember a young uh, Korean woman, a mother of two very small children who had a stage four uh, breast cancer. And when she came on the program, she was so devastated that she would likely leave her two babies without a mother that she could scarcely speak. And I remember the evening on death and dying when she was moved to talk about this and was flooded with tears. And I said to her, let me ask you a question. We don't know how long you have, and perhaps you might even survive this. But what your children, if you don't survive it, what your children will remember of you is how you were during this period of time. That's what they will remember. And let me ask you this. Do you want your children to remember you as devastated beyond belief by the tragedy of the laws? Or do you want your children to remember something else? And it was almost instantaneous that this thought 
which wasn't really a thought, it was a question. Did she want them to remember her uh, what, what she was expressing, or did she want them to remember something else? It was as if a light went on. And she just moved beyond the tragedy into the knowing that however much time she had, she wanted her children to remember her joy, her love, her courage. I've been reading an extraordinary biography. I don't have the name in front of me, uh, but the name of the woman is something like Eddie Hillison. I think I have it right. She was, um, she was a young Jewish woman in Amsterdam uh, at, during World War II. And the Nazis were in control of, of, of uh, Holland, the Netherlands. And uh, she had come out of a totally dysfunctional family and was just trying to find her way. And uh, she moved out of the family house and moved into, she was uh, 27, I think. She moved out of the family house and moved into a house uh, owned by an accountant who was 63. And they became lovers. And then she met a Jungian psychoanalyst who was also a palm reader. Actually, Jung had written an introduction to his book. And that encounter turned on an inner light in her. And she awakened spiritually for the first time. They, in turn, became lovers as well as soul friends and so on. She had been completely secular not a thought to religion of any kind. But what happened to her is that the inner God began to grow in her, and it grew so powerfully that even as the Nazis closed the loop around the Dutch Jews, and even as they began to register them and require them to wear yellow stars and say they couldn't take trolleys and couldn't go to restaurants and had curfews, and most of the other Jews were living in fear and terror. And she was living in the light. And she was living with a refusal to hate the Germans. And she was living with a deep joy in the beauty of everyday life. And as the loop closed further, she got a job working for the puppet Jewish council at the transit camp where the Nazis gathered the Jews to put them in the cattle cars for Auschwitz. And the, the conditions were horrific, but Eddie could be found standing in the mud in the transit camp, surrounded by all this terror, with tears of gratitude running down her cheeks for the beauty of life. And when it was finally time for her and her mother and father and brother to be put in the cattle cars to head for Auschwitz, she was seen walking gaily toward the cattle car with kind words for everyone. And she was heard as the train began to move out. Her voice sang out, bye. And she dropped a postcard from the cattle car that Dutch farmers found and forwarded to the address of a friend. And the card said, tell them that we went into the cattle car singing. Okay? Now, here's the thing. There were quite a few privileged Jews that had the opportunity to hide. And indeed, many of them made it through. But Eddie refused to hide. One friend even tried to kidnap her to hide her, but she refused it. She said that she needed to share the destiny of her people. 
she said that if all that remained of the Jews after the Holocaust were frightened people who had forgotten their purpose and being, that they would not have lived up to the spiritual grandeur that was their destiny if they understood what they were facing. Now, I offer you that not asking you to believe it, not asking you if you could be that, not asking myself if I could be that, but asking us to contemplate whether fear and a sense of the tragic are the only responses to living in the poly crisis. Whether we can't learn something from all the low income communities that have been living in the poly crisis forever and yet finding ways of joy and meaning to be alive. Whether we can't learn something from the ancient Hebrews and the early Christians who found that deep faith that there was a reality that was deeper than everyday life that they faced. You know, Swami Satchitananda taught that. He made it sound easy. He said that dying was just like putting on another set of clothes. He said we had to look sad so that people didn't think we were crazy. But he, he described it as easy. And as for the poly crisis, we weren't talking in those terms then. That was 30 years ago. But I remember him laughingly sometimes. sometimes he, he was asked about, you know, the environmental crisis and everything. He said, well, you know, I can't imitate him, but, you know, if people don't follow nature's laws, then there comes a time, you know. He says, maybe God just decides to reshuffle the whole deck. And he laughed, right? You know, if you don't follow the rules of nature, maybe there comes a time when God decides to reshuffle the deck. And he chuckled, you know. So there are all these beautiful examples of how to live in the polycrosis. And then there is all the attendant fear and tragedy and everything else that as we experience the poly crisis, many of us, myself included, are experiencing. You know, Plato talked about the noble lie. T.S. Eliot said that most people can't bear very much reality though what he was actually talking about is not the outer reality. He was talking about inner spiritual reality that most people couldn't bear, which is a more beautiful concept, but we can borrow his terms for this purpose. You know, Plato had Socrates describe the cave in which most people lived in the dark and at most saw shadows dancing on the wall from the little bit of sunlight that came in. And how the people who moved toward the entrance of the cave that the light seemed almost unbearable. You know, God said to Moses when Moses asked if he could see him, that he would hide him in a crack and that he could see him, glimpse him from behind because otherwise he'd be destroyed by the power of the light. So the question of how much light, how much reality, whether spiritual reality or the reality of the poly crisis any of us can bear is a very deep question. But we can all move toward the light. Every one of us, whatever of the nine personality types or 27 personality subtypes, you know, there's a teaching in Enneagram from age almost that each of those nine personality types is a face of God. And that according to our nature, we can move toward one of the nine faces of God. So we can all do that. So I don't know the answer, friends, but I'd like to open it up in just a moment for your thoughts. I'd just like to go into quiet for a moment together and just deep gratitude for the 
opportunity to be together in this beloved community of soul friends and of spirit. Uh, infinite gratitude for the teachings of Swami Satchitananda, who now, as I understand it, is free from the humanity that held him and is now able to reach all of us who seek him, unfettered by human limitations, the true teacher and the true teaching. However we experience the light, may it enter our hearts and our minds, our souls and our spirit and inhabit our bodies. A life of dedication is the path to inner peace. Dedication overcomes fear. Love overcomes fear. Wisdom overcomes fear. Peace, peace, peace. So let's open it up to questions, thoughts, and comments. And above all, let me suggest, if you can, with Zen brevity, say what you are discovering about how you live in the poly crisis, because that will be a beautiful part of this conversation, simply harvesting some of the ways we've learned to live in the poly crisis together. I can learn from you. I can help by calling on people if they raise their hand. Yeah, Claire, can you share something? Thank you, Ramananda. And thank you, Michael, for such a heartfelt and brilliant talk. There's so much to unpack. Um, I'd like to share a quote, and I'll drop it in the chat as well, because it's a little bit about a paragraph. But it's a quote that I have um, had with me since 9-11 um, that someone gave me. I'm a, an artist and an art teacher. And it's a quote by the American author, Catherine Ann Porter. And she said, the arts do live continuously and they live literally by faith. Their names and their shapes and their uses and their basic meanings survive unchanged in all that matters through times of interruption, dis diminishment and neglect. They outlive governments and creeds and societies, even the very civilization that produced them. They cannot be destroyed altogether because they represent the substance of faith and the only reality. They are what we find again when the ruins are cleared away. And that, um, as I say, I first came upon that 20 years ago with the first crisis that I remember in my life. I mean, the first, not personal crisis, but the first real global crisis that I had um, that impacted me personally. And it, it has stayed with me. It certainly um, continues to be applicable, at least for, for my sense of faith. And also one other thing, I'm currently reading a book about the artist Ruth Asawa, who um, I think a lot of people in the Bay Area are familiar with, but her childhood was spent in internment camps. And she used that time to uh, not only work on her art as a young woman, as a teenager, but to teach the the little kids there to to serve, to help. And she went on to have this brilliant career as an artist, but also founded the School of the Arts here in San Francisco. So she continued to be in service as well as find really the faith and meaning in her life through very difficult personal times um, through her art. So I just wanted to share that. That's really beautiful. Thank you for that. And uh, let me say I recovered how to see you all. So I'm back seeing you all, which I'm really thrilled by. Um, who else would like to speak? Swamiji, do you want to call on people? If yes, you... Lorna, go ahead. Hi, Michael. Thank you so much. It was comforting to hear your words. Um, I live in a 55 plus community and I guess I don't, I'm, I'm really just kind of asking for help here. Um, I'm somebody who does who feels very cautious about the vaccine, and um, I'm finding this being one of the many issues that is causing tremendous uh, divisiveness, even in this really loving community. And um, I just wondered what your thoughts were about that. I mean, even though 
personally, I don't feel that the, the, the shot is right for me and my body and the issues that I have in this moment. But there's a part of me that feels like an imposter for not doing it and not taught, really taught. If someone asks me, I say, no, I haven't gotten it yet. But then there's a part of me that's beginning to awaken. This is, well, you know, even though I don't believe in the shot, get it just to be part of the tribe. So that's really, you know, I guess the, the issue that I'm, I'm struggling with, how do I stay part of the tribe and true to myself? Yeah, that's a great question, Lorna. Thank you. Let me tell you, um, you can go to our website and formation called covidstrategies.org, COVID Strategies. Wonderful. Um, and, uh, and also uh, uh, go to the companion uh, resilienceproject.org on, on the polycrisis. Or uh, if you want to see the funder version, it's omega.org. I'm sorry, resilienceproject.org. NGO or omega.ngo, but um, the COVID thing is covidstrategies.org. So let me try to respond to that. Let me begin by saying there is no single right answer and that different people have different realities. If we demonize the opposition, you know, like liberals, many progressives, not all by any means, take the view, you know, because so many Republicans are, are not into the, but obviously that's not exclusive. I know many progressives who don't want the vaccine. But if you demonize the opposition, you know, who are those troglodytes? What rock did they crawl out from under? You know, actually it's a very complicated issue. For me, the reality is that I am deeply aware, not just of the COVID vaccine, but of many vaccines, that there are vulnerable subpopulations that experience significant negative outcomes when they take the vaccine. That's just true. Um, but when I measure that against the public health benefit of uh, reaching herd immunity, I incline, I got the vaccines myself, uh, and I incline in that direction. Um, so, and particularly, you live in an over 55 community. So, we know what has happened in older communities when the vaccine hit, when the virus hits. And we have no certainty at all that the variants that are emerging, in other words, there's an ongoing war between the variants and the vaccines. We have no, no certainty at all that the vaccines will continue to triumph. They're amazing that they've done so, so far. So it's a very profound question. Um, and I think what I would say to you is, I would go to the, I would, explore in the deepest part of myself what my soul is telling me, what the closest I can get to the divine is telling me, and simply listen. I could say so much more about this, but in order to hear from more people, I'll leave it there. Who's next? Uh, Jim Quay. As you know, Michael, I'm uh, creating a uh, circle of trust retreat, which I'm calling the heart of resilience. And your talk has just um, resonated in so many ways, I don't even know where to begin. Um, but let me say this. Um, we're certainly facing, I think, a diminished world. And there's a lot of shame and grief that people feel about the legacy, the world that we are turning over to children and grandchildren. And the theoretical physicist Brian Greene has imagined a real diminished world in his book, um, Until the End of Time, where he imagines the end of the universe um, and speculates on what would that mean 
in terms of human beings and the, and the meaning they make of their existence, if they knew at some point the universe was going to, to end. And what he comes to is that the only meaning available lies in each moment, the, the, the present. And combining that with some of the comments you made about the uh, um, keeping the values that we hold most alive, the best legacy that's available to us is to live each present moment being witnessed by children, grandchildren, friends, et cetera, et cetera, um, holding those highest values, that that's the most resilient behavior and legacy that we can, that we can offer. And we have to manifest that in each present moment. And that's what I hope to explore in this uh, retreat. Thank you, Jim, so much. And we're so honored that your work on the Parker Palmer Circles of Trust tradition is part of Commonweal. As you know, I did a conversation with Parker Palmer uh, yesterday, which will be up on the New School website before it too long. And, um, and we're, we're just very honored to have his work represented uh, alongside Healing Circles Global um, at Commonweal. Thank you very much. Other thoughts and reflections? Yes, Sabine. I'm not quite sure how to put this. I, I have uh, sort of stumbled in here to this uh, event. <laughs> I think somebody meant me to be here. But um, Well, welcome. We we're all stumbling. Thank you. I, and I, we'll, we'll all stumble out at the end. I lived in Stinson for a long time, and our son had the, had the great good fortune to go through the public school system in Bolinas which has served him very well in life. Um, but but I have been, I, 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 things you were talking about, the way you were talking, the concepts, uh, I was exposed to fairly early in my life and pretty much drifted away from them. Uh, 30 years in Alcoholics Anonymous has brought me back to them. Um, but um, I, I guess really I have one question. How can I... Uh, review this, uh, this uh, find this whole talk of yours today to go over it about 10 times and, and listen more carefully. Uh, very easy. Ken Adams is going to have it up at uh, the new school at Commonweal, which is tns.commonweal.org. Uh, it'll be up on the new school. And it'll also be up on the San Francisco Interval Yoga site, Ramanandaji. Yeah, so it'll be very easy. And on the New School at Commonweal, you can find about 300 conversations like this. Okay. So it's not fun to look. Okay. Other thoughts? I want to get in as many people as possible. So let's hear from everybody who might be holding back, but uh, let's hear from people. Yes, Sandra. Hi, everyone. Uh, coming to you from Columbia, Tennessee. It's a... Uh, always so good to be a part of IYI anywhere, but especially with you, Ramananda and Michael, um, because uh, I do hold you in um, as, as teachers and mentors to me uh, and the work that I do. Uh, but some points that really helped me a lot uh, in this talk was talking about people's different personalities uh, in response to um, the poly crisis. And I think about it particularly with some close friends uh, over the last year and, and how we have, um, our friendships have deepened with this mutual respect of, I handle things very differently than they do. And uh, Annie talking about holding space. Um, I think that is really, really important. And, and then just in Zen brevity, um, I've just started teaching yoga again in person with a private client who has this beautiful space. And she came out of our session the other day and said, can we start doing this once a week on the porch for the community? Will you come? And um, we need this meditation and relaxation. And I always tend to think in the bigger picture, oh, I'm not doing enough. It's community. It's exactly where I need to be. And 
uh, in supporting, um, you know, on that level in this um, poly crisis and particularly COVID. Um, so anyway, I just want to say hello. I thank you so much. And I thank you for all you write in your caring bridge as well, because it introduced me to Parker Palmer, who I did not know about and, and the healing circles. So it's just good to see you. Thank you for being here. By the way, Sue Evans, who's on the call, is the coordinator of the new COVID strategies site. And Sue, did, did you have any reflections as you listened to the talk? Just wonder if anything came up. Um, no, it just it just kind of changes the perspective, mm -hmm. you know, from being so focused on one aspect to something just so much larger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right now. It's wonderful to work with Sue. One of the things I have to tell you in, in 44 years of doing Commonweal is that I've had the opportunity to uh, uh, bring into our work uh, quite a few people from the integral yoga community, and I have never been disappointed by, um, by the beauty of their souls and the dedication to the work. I think Ruth Hennig is on this call. There's a Ruth H. Is that Ruth Hennig? I don't know if she's willing to emerge from her cell phone. Yes, but, yes, it is, Michael. <laughs> Ruth, you you may have caught my my uh, references to uh, the skepticism with which a number of our colleagues uh, greeted my early interest in the poly crisis, and I'd love to uh, hear your thoughts about where we are now. Well. Um... I did. I did take note of that, and <laughs> <laughs> thought if it's not directed specifically at me, it's a subset of um, of which I'm a part. And I don't know if I'm currently on video for people or well, not. We can see you. Okay. So um, thank you both for this amazing um, this amazing moment. Um, uh, it's a beautiful day here in Maine, and um, the the sunlight is streaming in from the water. And I was tempted to not participate, and I'm so glad that I that I did. <laughs> um, and I guess um, two very quick responses to um, your 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 talk, Michael. One is that. I have been seeking through this past year um, to find joy in the moment, um, beauty in the moment. And you, you talked about that so, so beautifully. Um, and that's been a practice that I've found has been extraordinarily helpful and health giving to me. And I feel like um, in some ineffable, immutable way, if I'm finding um, joy in the moment, then that I, somehow I'm reflecting that out to um, the broader community and, and universe. And so that is one, you know, small grain of sand on the beach, but um, um, it's, it can't be a bad thing. Mm. And, um, um, but where Michael and I have talked um, about the poly crisis over time is this question of, okay, so um, what do we do about it? We, we acknowledge that it's real. How do, you know, how, how do you respond in a, in a meaningful way that actually does move the needle and change things? And I, you know, I still don't have the answer to that, but I feel like, um, not doing anything because the problem seems so big isn't really any longer an acceptable response. And um, finding a point of entry at whatever element of the poly crisis you feel, you know, um, is, is most resonant for you, most accessible for you, or where you have particular talents and skills and insights to bring to bear, just start there. And, um, and some of these pieces, like climate change, like um, uh, 
health and and economic inequities at a global or or a community level if if we are working on one or two of those core problems we're fixing a lot of other elements to the poly crisis so that's where i am beginning to you know try to focus my thinking and and my energies um looking for that point of entry which um, takes me, hopefully, to um, a, a broader approach to the to the poly crisis. Understanding that none of us, probably, with the possible exception of Michael, can really get our arms and our minds and our hearts around the whole thing all at once. So that's that's where I'm at. Thank you so much, Ruth. And I just want to say uh, to those of you who don't know Ruth, which is probably almost everybody except me, that um, in my experience of 30 years working on the foundation side, as well as the nonprofit side of environmental health and justice, Ruth Hennig is, is the single deepest strategist that I ever met on environmental health and justice. And she and our mutual colleague, Gary Cohen, who started Healthcare Without Harm, uh, at Commonweal, actually, uh, in a series of meetings there, uh, and who used to walk around a, a lake in uh, Cambridge, in uh, near Cambridge together, um, in Jamaica Plains, a reservoir maybe. But in any case, the two of them had the deepest st strategic insight in environmental health and justice that I ever saw. And Gary was actually the one, although he, he and Ruth agreed in our conversations that they didn't see how this was going to be particularly useful. But Gary was the one who said, Michael, I don't see how this moves the needle. And the point is that, <clears throat> that he and Ruth wanted to focus on things they knew they had a shot at changing. And that's really important because all the, the silo issue or the focal area issues have to be addressed in that way. You have to be trying to fix something and have a shot at it. Whereas the poly crisis, you're absolutely right, doesn't lend itself to that. But what it does lend itself to is awareness, is awareness that whatever focal areas you're working in, if you don't take into account the reality of the poly crisis and that there's going to be shock after shock, your, your strategies will not be well informed. That's and right. so I think that's the key point that uh, whatever, as Ruth said, whether it's toxics or climate change or inequality or women's rights or whatever it is, if you're not aware that we're living in this period of time, your strategies will be short lived. So I know we're right at the top. And Ramanandaji, I'm going to turn it back to you. But before we end, I would love to ask you, before we do a close, and I'll do a close with you, um, what reflections you have on the talk? Thank you, Michael. I've also, like others, been so inspired by so many different things that you touched on. Mm. <clears throat> Something that you alluded to uh, personally really uh, resonates with me. Um, you didn't say it specifically, but it, but I connected that this, this way that <clears throat> that I believe um, that um, my effort to awaken personally my own spiritual path is absolutely. In, in line or, or aligned with my intention to be of service in the world, that they're not two separate paths, but one path. Um, because as soon as I get a little more connected within, I'm connecting myself to that same consciousness that I believe dwells in everything. And I'm inspired um, to, to participate right, in that a ground of being that we all share by serving in some way. So I, I just, and, and I, and I see that, and, and Swami Satchitananda encourages us this way, not to isolate ourselves um, for long periods of time doing deep spiritual practice, but to do both our 
isolated or, or formal practice alone and in quiet and to participate in the world because the, those two things, because of the way those two things complement each other. Um, so that's, that's been important for me to, to know that um, my own spiritual path is not something separate from serving in the world and, and responding to what's happening in our world, bearing witness to it, praying for the well-being of others, as well as taking specific action. Um, I think the more, uh, the deeper we go within, the more we get aligned with the universal will. Um, like you were, Michael, when you looked down on Commonweal, uh, uh, when you looked down on that building, the RCA building, um, you somehow got connected to this higher will that uh, then was able to function through you. And I, th I think that's where things really happen when we somehow align with that higher will. Mm. Thank you, Swanji. I'll, I'll close, if I may, with just a very, very short story. I, I mentioned the power of soul friendship. I mentioned the friend that I met um, at the San Francisco IYI talk eight years ago on how how we have walked together in in spirit and human discourse for the last eight years. Uh, about a month ago, uh, she and I were walking uh, near our, my wife and I, our house in Bolinos, and we were talking about spirit, and, and she is uh, an advanced Qigong practitioner, and she talked about, you know, how advanced practitioners could do all kinds of things that nobody believes. And I said, I don't know about that firsthand, but I absolutely believe that teachers can appear to uh, their students who are ready or their those who have shared their teaching who are ready. I believe that for a certainty, just as I know that for many people in the cancer help program and elsewhere that they've had experiences of loved ones who've just died appearing physically before them. So I know that to be true. And as I said that, Swamiji materialized in front of me, not in full form, but in a kind of a translucent form for the first time in my life. And I hadn't I had often talked to him inwardly over these last 37 years, but that had never happened. And so for the last few months, Swamiji has been very present for me. And, um, and in my own healing work, having gone through a major surgery eight months ago and facing another one, that's not as big, but still uh, involves opening the body uh, in the next month or so. Um, his presence is uh, very powerful. And, and I really, I don't know how the world, the metaphysical world works, um, but I do sense that, I do sense that we do find people on the other side, and I do sense that they're available to us, not only great spiritual teachers, but others who um, come to us internally uh, as people who we are close to and, and see with our mind's eye as present. And I don't think they just exist inside us. I think there's a transpersonal reality that we tap into. And I do believe that the great teachers, when they are free of their human form, that actually their power uh, uh, to um, support us and to find our own inner teacher increases. So that's just my particular way of looking at the world. So with that, let's just go into a final moment of silence and gratitude together.
Peace, peace. Swamiji, back over to you. Uh, thank you, Michael. I think I can speak for everyone in just expressing our gratitude to you for spending this time with us and <clears throat> sharing these stories and that perspective of yours. The story about Eti in particular really, really touched my heart. Wow. Um, so if we could if we could all embrace even a little of that uh, intention to, to remain both participating in the events of our world in a very real way and at the same time really appreciating the, the miracle of the moment. Uh, wow, what a, what a meaningful way to live. So I just thank you all. I thank you all for coming. Um, Michael's talk will be posted. It's in the chat if you want to look up. His talk will be posted eventually on tns.commonweal.org. And we'll be posting it also on Integral Yoga TV, which is a, a site where you can find uh, many programs, yoga classes, and talks like Michael's. So thank you again, Michael. Um, I, I'd like to at least offer a a brief mantra that Swami Satchidananda encourages us, encouraged us to share at the end of a program as a way of sending peaceful energy out um, into the world. It's the Loka Samasta mantra that many of you know. So you can chant along with me if you know this. Loka Samasta Tsukino Bhavantu May the entire universe be filled with peace and joy, love and light. Jai Sri Satguru Maharaj Ki. We bow to that inner light within all of us. Okay, thank you again, Michael, and thank you, Ken, for your service and recording. Thanks to all of you for joining today. That's just such a joy to be together. See you down the trail. <laughs> <laughs>